good afternoon everyone on behalf of team ifl finance i thank all of you for joining us on this call i am rajesh rajak cfo accompanied by mr nirmal jain as the chairman mr monu ratra ceo ifl home finance and mr n venkatesh managing director at samasta microfinance uh, i'll hand over to our chairman mr jain to comment on the economy and the group's overall strategy and plans over to you sir uh, thank you rajesh <coughs> Uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody on this call. So, macro environment and prospects for V-shaped recovery uh, now look much brighter with the no bad news budget that we had uh, yesterday, and also the capex and investment outlays that are provided in the budget uh, that makes 11% GDP a very achievable target. Also, I would say that the execution track record of uh, this finance minister and government uh, inspires confidence about. Uh, performance on the budget proposals next year and also later. Uh, and as the economy recovers from a negative to a very strong positive growth, we should see a robust demand for credit, uh, especially for MSME and affordable housing. And the underlying trends of digitization and formalization of the economy will further boost uh, the demand for credit. And we are fairly optimistic about our business prospects as almost our entire business is driven by these two sectors. Uh, which is MSME and affordable housing. So when you look at microfinance, there's the first letter M of MSME, it's the micro uh, businesses, income generating activities that we fund. And also in gold loan, I guess almost 75 to 80% of our loans are for short term working capital requirements of the small businesses. Uh, in this context, we are also very pleased to note that now liquidity has eased, uh, credit demand is robust, interest rates are falling, collection efficiency is getting better. Uh, construction real estate, which had become an Achilles heel, is likely to see a substantial exit very soon, and so on. But still, from a longer term perspective, what we have seen in the last two and a half years is that the liquidity uh, situation uh, can be volatile for MBFCs as they depend on wholesale sources of funding. Banks, as we know, have access to stable liability sources like deposits and besides access to uh, lender of last resort RBI. Historically, banks have built an asset mix which is of large corporate loans and retail with focus on priority sector. Uh, in the last few years, we have seen that they are looking at a shift in their balance sheet mix towards retail assets. And this is where partnership between NBFCs that have established branch network, specialized underwriting skills in the niche segment and a trained workforce becomes a win-win. While banks will grow their own network to meet requirements of the growing economy, more often than not, NDFCs will be more efficient in terms of cost and also more effective in collection and servicing when it comes to small ticket loans. And it is not surprising that in the recent past, Finance Minister, RBI, State Bank of India's Chairman, everybody has emphasized co-lending as a way ahead uh, for banks and NDFCs partnership. I think they all recognize that this is the most optimum and viable way to channelize uh, bank liquidity into productive and credit start segments of the society over long term. So our experience of the last few months is encouraging. While it takes enormous time to get agreements passed, legal, compliance, risk, and business departments of a bank, and also workflow and technology integrated, and also bank start flow will start with 10 branches, then they will scale it up to 50 and so on. <laughs> but the good news is, that most banks, almost all the banks that we have spoken to, are very keen on the partnership and co-lending. And two, the market size and opportunity is very large. So when we look at our market share in say affordable housing or MSME is just about one to two percent, or even in gold loan, if you look at the formal uh, lending by banks and uh, uh, NBFCs, we may be about three to four percent market share. And similar in microfinance. So we expanded our branch network in 2019 and paused it in 2020. And we are seeing positive impact of operating, operating leverage in the results now. Uh, despite being at the forefront of digital technology, we see the need and opportunity to expand branch network, particularly for microfinance and also a few locations for gold loan. And typically our branches break even in 12 to 18 months. So the expansion will be gradual through 2021. Uh, in terms of provisions and write-offs, we take a prudent and conservative approach, while write-offs, wherever feasible as per tax laws, can give us tax break. But our recovery and collection efforts are not impacted by the accounting. Also, collection efficiency is interpreted differently by different companies. 
we report based on dues for the uh, the dues collected for the month and then and therefore we don't include in the numerator the dues for the previous month collected this month whereas the many other companies have a different approach and they take the total amount of total cash received from the borrowers uh coming to technology we have made substantial progress in technology and our plan to accelerate uh, and we have plans to accelerate investment in digital technology in all the product categories in all our businesses we are already listed on credal as a vendor as a certified vendor and we plan to be on ok network very soon and before i sign off i wish to highlight social impact our business is creating and in this presentation you will find a separate uh, section on that and effort we are making towards environment and sustainability as well is covered in our presentation so i am not spending much time on it uh, with this i hand over for question and answer thank you thank you very much you long okay me. thank you uh, mr jain uh, i'll just uh, begin with uh, giving uh, a brief update on the business number yeah sorry my apologies actually i the uh, our cfo has to speak about the financial numbers yeah Uh, and then yeah, uh, we'll sure. open it for question and uh, questions. So, uh, IFL financial net profit was rupees two sixty eight point three crores in third quarter FY twenty one, which was up twenty six percent quarter on quarter and forty seven percent year on year. We recorded the highest ever pre provision operating profit of rupees six hundred and fifteen crores during the quarter, which was up nine percent quarter on quarter and one hundred and twenty seven percent year on year. This was driven by volume growth, reduction in cost of funds, and higher efficiency in management of operating costs. A loan AUM grew 3% quarter on quarter and 17% year on year to 42,264 crores. A core segments grew faster at 21% year on year to 37,365 crores. A disbursement across core segments for the quarter are significantly higher than last year's same period, that is quarter three. Home loans have grown disbursements at 90% year on year, gold loans at 25%, business loans at 43% and microfinance loans at 61% growth in disbursements year on year. Retail loans including consumer loans and small business finance constitutes 90% of our loan book. A strong characteristic of our loan book is the large proportion of loans that are compliant with RBI's priority sector lending norms. About 68% of our home loans, 47% of business loans, and 90% of our microfinance loans are PSL compliant. In aggregate, nearly 43% of our loans are PSL compliant. The large share of retail and PSL compliant loans are a significant value in the current environment where we can sell down these loans to raise long-term resources. Annualized return on assets for the quarter was 2.6%, and return on equity was 18.4%. Our tier one capital adequacy stands at 18%, and total capital adequacy stands at 21.4%. Our average cost of borrowing declined 10 basis points quarter on quarter to 9% for the quarter. Consolidated GNPs and NNPs stood at 1.61 and 0.77% of loans respectively, as against 1.81 and 0.77% respectively in the September quarter. Without considering effect of the Supreme Court interim order, Proforma GNPA and NNPA would have been 2.87 and 1.46 percent respectively. Provision coverage, excluding standard asset provision under India's norms on stage three assets, was was 170 percent for the quarter. A brief update on liquidity. During the quarter, we raised 3,987 crores term loans and refinanced from banks, cash and cash equivalents, and committed credit lines from banks and institutions. For rupees five thousand one forty nine crore as of thirty first December two thousand and twenty, we continue to have nil exposure to commercial paper. We have a positive ALM across all buckets, whereby inflows cover or exceed expected outflows. A brief update on co-lending and co-origination strategy. In line with the strategy of growing through partnership model during the quarter, we entered into co-lending arrangement with Standard Chartered Bank and ICICI Bank for extending home loans and secured MSME loans. We have already commenced business in partnership with CSB Bank for disbursing gold loans, as announced last quarter. A brief update on digitization and analytics. We continue to focus on digitization and analytics to improve customer experience and enable a convenient one-stop shop for customers' credit and investment needs. We have completely digitized our business loans journey, right from customer onboarding to underwriting, disbursement, and collections. We are collaborating with the fintech ecosystem to further enhance our platform and customer experience. With these strong partnerships, we intend to co-create solutions for enhanced experience in SME lending. 
We have enabled digital top up to retain quality customers in home loan and secured MSME loans wherein the entire journey is paperless. Communication for accepting sanction letter and e agreement to send to eligible customers sent via SMS. The disbursement is automatic with no manual intervention. Jatpat Home Loans, a pan India product for instant home loans, helps all the stakeholders in the housing finance industry, individual home borrowers, developers, and company get a loan in an instant manner. Our home loan disbursed via Jatpat Loans has gained significant traction. Out of the total home loan disbursed in the month of December 2020, 89% was sourced through Jatpat Loans. The corresponding percentage in January 2020 was 61%. In addition to digital top up, the renewal of gold loan launched earlier. During the quarter, we have launched home pickup of gold loan, wherein the loan officer would visit the applicant's home or office and the entire process tablet based, onboarding, sanction, and disbursement. IFL Loans app is being increasingly used for various transactions by customers and has been especially beneficial during COVID lockdown times, giving customers ease and convenience of access. We have about 175,000 average active users on the, on the app for the month of December. That brings an end to the update. We will now open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone? who wishes to ask a question, you may press star and 1 on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Anyone who wishes to ask a question, you may press star and 1. Participants, you may press star and 1 to ask a question. The first question is from the line of Abira Mayer from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, first of all, congratulations for the result. Uh, I have two questions. One is with regards to the collection efficiency that's given in slide number 15. Uh, for the business loans, it's mentioned that quarter three collection efficiency is 75%, microfinance is 77%. First of all, are these average numbers or ending numbers? That's one. Uh, and if these are average numbers, then it seems to me that they haven't increased from September 20. Because if you look at your last set of results, uh, it was 75% for business loan and 78% for microfinance in September itself. So was there no improvement in the quarter? Yeah. So uh, I think this quarter, things came out of uh, COVID. And uh, what we have seen is that the true picture emerges only after uh, COVID. Just one second. Slide number 16. Uh, but there is an improvement in... Uh, business loan from 60 to 75 percent, and in home loan from 81 to 90, and microfinance from 69 to 77. So these are the monthly averages, but there's a significant improvement in this quarter vis-à-vis uh, -vis the previous quarter. Yes, sir. No, I'm just trying to figure it out from the end of last quarter. Last time we had given it on a monthly basis, and uh, in September it was 75 and 78 percent for business loan and microfinance. So microfinance has actually come down over the quarter. Uh, or, and business loan has been flat over October, November, and December? No, so what happens is that most of the time the collection happens mostly towards the end of the quarter. Okay. And uh, therefore, when you see monthly averages, then they will give you the correct picture of uh, how things are moving. And also, you know, as I explained in my this thing, that collection efficiency is measured differently by different players. So yeah. what we do is that something is due for the month of December. Obviously, you collect November month also in December. And yeah. uh, that is actually... Uh, that happens uh, to some extent in all our businesses uh, uh, that doesn't get counted in collection efficiency. But if you look at then towards the end of the quarter, obviously collection peaks up, uh, picks up, and therefore uh, uh, you can't comp really compare September with October, we can compare September with December. Uh, so what was the numbers of December, sir? One second, December month, I'll give it to you. So December actually is 93%. This is for business too. So October, October was pretty. Uh, October was down. So actually, October normal, but December picked up. So 68, 72, and 93. Uh, so this is for business loans, is it? And no, microfinance. 
Oh, this is for microfinance and business, uh, business loan has remained. So business loan is one segment which has remained a little sluggish because of. Uh, okay. Uh, so it has remained around. It has hold around 75 uh, throughout the quarter. Got it, sir. Got it. And is there any like programs in place to correct this? Because obviously this is sort of. So okay, I'll tell you the collection is so collection is happen, happening with some delay because these are small borrowers. So you know typically uh, you know the so you might see the 30 DPD. But when we look at 60 and 90 days, then we are seeing that the collection is improving. Got it, got it, got it, sir. So basically, this is being pushed back by a month, but not exactly going into NPA status because this is typical character for the smaller borrowers, the smaller loans because you need to. Uh, uh, they are all passing through. Uh, uh, now things are recovering, so we see that the collection is also improving, but it's happening with a lag. Got it, got it. Uh, I'll join back with you, sir. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Thomas from Aberdeen Standard Investments. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I have one question with relate with regards to uh, liquidity. Uh, you've got a slide on this topic, which is slide 20, and it shows that your um, reliance on on term loan, on bank lending, basically keeps going up, um, and equally. Um, uh, bond refinancing is, is, is trending down quite significantly. If, if you could share a little bit of color what the drivers are, um, is it at risk appetite in the onshore bond market is still fairly fairly muted? Um, so, or is it, is it purely a reflection of, of pricing? Um, yeah, a bit of color on that would be helpful. Okay. So a significant of our financing is now happening through securitization assignment, which is not debt, but what we are doing is we are selling down our assets. So last quarter we have sold down something like 4,400 crores, and also the earlier sold down assets of 2,000 crores would have got uh, repaid. So that has become a significant contributor. Now coming to refinancing, now refinancing happens in, uh, but if you really look at the refinancing, then from 152 in Q2, it has gone up to 500 in Q3. The, the debentures of bonds that you are seeing has come down, but bond, so you know in Q2 we had a bond issuances to the bank under the TLTRO scheme. Uh, so when banks are funding, actually their appraisal and their whether they are funding it through bonds or term loan is similar. The Q4 last year bond issue which you see 2,856 is the dollar bond issue that we did, which is a foreign currency uh, dollar denominated bond uh, that we issued in international market 400 million dollars. This obviously will do once in a while, maybe once in two years. Uh, therefore, I don't think there's a significant change in mix, uh, but the nature of business is such that sometimes you'll see, uh, you know, some of the pieces of pie moving in different ways. Okay, thank you. And then would you say, just on a forward-looking basis, would you say that the dollar bond market remains important for the company to um, for refinancing purpose? Not really, actually. Uh, to be very honest, uh, dollar bond market is more opportunistic and more a diversification. But uh, in fact, when the dollar bonds have been quoting at a discount, we applied to RBI to allow us to buy back, but RBI refused us permission for that. Uh, but uh, this is the market which is uh, there, and at, you know when the opportunity is right and the market is favorable, we can always tap it. But we aren't really dependent on this. But you know, over a longer time period, this can be a good source of. Uh, money in a periodic basis. So this is a market you can tap say once in two years or you know thereabout. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashwin Kumar from HSBC. Please go ahead. Yes, yeah, hi. Uh, my question is on the uh, collection efficiency uh, part. Uh, just wanted to uh, understand uh, right, in, uh, some of the segments like uh, business loan and so on. Uh, it's only like 75 uh, percent, but uh, uh, if I look at your uh, NPAs as such, even uh, if we exclude uh, the Supreme Court dispensation, uh, that's all gone up uh, you know, very significantly. So, uh, I mean, uh, how do we uh, look at this? Is it like a lot of customers uh, are missing one or uh, two installments? Because if it is uh, on average 75 percent, it means like, uh, uh, I mean, it, it would mean like one customer is staying in October, another customer is staying in November, and Bond, right? like, I mean, so 75% means 3 out of 4 customers are paying in the same month and out of remaining 25% customers, you know, maybe uh, some of them, 20, 22, 23% are paying in the next, say, 
second month or third month. So they don't pay for three months, then only they become, uh, they get reported in, uh, as NPA. And in business loan, you know, our, our loan book GMP is 2.46%. Uh, but if you look at our, uh, on a performer, this is 6.5%. We also take an aggressive write-offs and uh, uh, write-downs in this uh, segment. Uh, you know, because, uh, see, wherever we see that uh, from a tax point of view and from the, uh, you know, the age of the loan point of view, I mean, it's, proper, you know, it's prudent to write it off, we do that. But that doesn't affect our collection efficiency, our collection effort, because our collection people, they get the buckets of all the loans, so regardless of how we have done the accounting. And also two-thirds of our loan book and business loan, or more than two-thirds is uh, loan against property or secured. Uh, there also we are seeing uh, slightly lesser stress. So business loan, there is a stress, and that is why I perform a GPA six and a half. But it's, in a way, uh, two things have basically helped us to you know contain the damage, which is, one is significant part of our loan book is secured, and two, uh, we have taken aggressive write-offs as required. Okay, and uh, similarly, if you can give some uh, card on uh, the microfinance, that again, that also, I think it's only 77%. Uh, uh, so, I mean, what kind of credit losses are you seeing there, and uh, I mean, which states uh, are you seeing stress? Do you have any exposure to uh, ASAM or as such? So, you know, microfinance, fortunately, we are all over. We have very well spread out network. And 88% uh, of our business is from rural segments. So if you really see microfinance industry, then the performance has been very uh, uh, varied across the companies. But in the COVID time period, the companies that have been more dependent on urban areas got impacted more uh, uh, compared to companies that have been uh, predominantly uh, servicing the rural areas. So if you look at industry-wide, I think 46% is urban, 54% is rural, but in our case, 88% of our customers are uh, from rural areas. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, microfinance, uh, we have done, uh, uh, we have provided additional 40 crores in this quarter because, uh, and uh, GNPs have gone up to 2.4%, 2.24%. Uh, 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 secondly, we are also, our ASAM exposure is minuscule and uh, all over we are that way well distributed. We are almost there in 20, 25 states uh, state now. Uh, so we aren't really dependent on any one state as such. Okay. And uh, how much will be your exposure to uh, uh, like uh, uh, Assam, uh, which has been under news? Our Assam exposure, uh, I can tell you what. It's two percent. Two percent is two percent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one point seven nine percent to be precise is Assam exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maharashtra also has been very badly hit for some of the microfinance companies. Our exposure to Maharashtra is only two point seven nine percent. Okay. Thank you. And uh, just one uh, question uh, in the microfinance uh, again. Uh, the ticket size, uh, the squadron suddenly uh, uh, dropped significantly. So, is there any, any change in strategy or something? So, uh, you know, but the last quarter probably we did a uh, little bit of more individual loans, which had a higher ticket size. One second. Venkatesh, microphone, uh, Venkatesh, you are on call? Okay. So, I can get back to you on that, but I can. Uh, yeah, the individual ticket size are low, uh, are slightly higher as compared to the group ticket size. Yeah, oh, sorry, I was on mute actually. I can answer, I mean, yeah, but in terms of uh, uh, the ticket size going up, it was for various size. As Nirmal said, we have also added individual loans to our portfolio. And plus, in certain markets where we see traction of uh, things, we have, uh, uh, every state has got a segregated uh, higher ticket size because we have gone, in many of the markets, we are getting into the second and third cycle we gradually increase the cycle of, uh, I mean, ticket size of loans as we get into the different cycles. So uh, that's another factor which uh, uh, the loan ticket sizes have gone up. Thank you. Thank you. I request all the participants, please restrict to two questions per participant. If time permit, please come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. The next question is from the line of Prashant Sridhar from SBI Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, any guidance on uh, restructuring or the DCCO extension? No, DCCO extension for what? Sorry? Uh, you, so I believe you have a, a construction finance book as well, which you're going to put under AI. Yeah, so construction finance book, you know, actually almost significant part of our, you know, substantial part of our book will probably move it to AI. So all these things will become irrelevant because the book will be held by AI. An alternate investment fund. That is what we are planning to do. 
Okay. Uh, and what about restructuring on the remaining book? What kind of expectations do you have? So, uh, remaining book uh, will continue, and uh, there we have adequate provision. So, uh, as of uh, December, and we are carrying 458 crore rupees of provision, and also we are written down and written off for quite aggressively. Uh, some of that money will also be, uh, you know, will have potential to get collected. So I think we have a significant provision for the remaining. So the remaining book will have two parts. One is the smaller loans, which are say less than 20, 25 crore rupees of loans, and they have been generally doing well. So very small ticket loans, we are not planning to uh, move it to AF. And then there'll be a few residual projects. For that, we'll have adequate cover. But this will become insignificant part of our book. And as we had guided earlier, that you know going forward, uh, as a group, we are doing our real estate funding through alternate investment fund, which is part of our wealth management subsidiary company, AMC. In the NBFC HFC, we might continue to do uh, the residual uh, funding of the project that we already financed, or the green and environmentally sustainable building that we are focusing on, but also the typically small ticket uh, construction loans in tier two and tier three, where we can uh, dovetail that or we can connect, you know, we can have a forward linkages to our home loans. But uh, then, you know, the, the prime, after the transfer to this AF, this book will become insignificant. Okay, understood. And uh, you would receive uh, consideration for the other investors' portion in upfront cash, or uh, you know that would also be in some sort of security. So what will happen is that 3,600 crore rupees is the target size of the fund, out of which say 1,200 crore rupees is the sponsor's contribution. The 2,400 rupees upfront cash you get, and uh, you know from our income and as a point of view, uh, so our 3,600 or our real estate book has been. Uh, generating return of around 14.5% if you see last quarter. The What we can accrue on the remaining part of the book will depend on the valuation because this AI will not be managed by MDFC, it will be completely independent. And uh, uh, accrue, you know, the, our target is that the entire, most of the exit will happen say, over three year time period. Till then, the income accrual can be conservative, but at the same time, this will also save us the provisioning because in the last few quarters, uh, uh, we have been really hit very hard by this uh, segment of our business in terms of provisioning requirement. Sure. Uh, did I hear that right? You said the total consideration uh, for the Aribo is 6,600 crores? So, no, no, no. The total consideration for Aribo is not 3,600 crores. We will transfer, say, something like 3,000 crore rupees of uh, Aribo to the fund. 600 crore rupees will be cash or liquidity in the fund, 500 to 600 crores. So whatever we are transferring, we'll be transferring at book value. Wherever required, write down the write-up, we already taken that. The remaining part of book will remain in our book, uh, you know, as uh, construction finance or whatever it is. Out of the 3,600, 1,200 crore rupees will be the contribution, which probably will be the AI, which will remain as an investment in our book. 2,400 crore rupees, the cash, maybe 1,800 crore cash and 1,600 600 crore will remain in the fund, will come to us. Uh, understood. Understood. Sure. Sure. Uh, so, uh, the sir, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, uh, I'm interested the... to come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. Thank you. I request to all the participants, please restrict to two questions per participant. The next question is from the line of Vivek Ramakrishnan from DSP Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Vivek, may I request you to unmute your line from your side and go ahead with your question. Hello, uh, hi, is it clear now? So may I request yeah. you to speak a little louder? Yeah, hi. Um, see, on the on the uh, business loan portfolio, your average ticket size has been coming down, but your onboarding yield has also been coming down. Um, is it, uh, I mean, typically would you you'd, you'd think that a smaller size, you'd get better yields. And uh, then also, if you see the collection efficiency has also been um, only gradually improving, which is par for the course for these kind of smaller customers. How do you see yeah, the risk? So I think, no, it's a good question, but uh, uh, what has happened in business loan, that incrementally we are doing business loan only digitally. So there are very small ticket loans done, which are like, you know, maybe a lakh rupees, 50,000 rupees, 2 lakh rupees, and that is bringing down the ticket size. So now if you see incremental business loan, there are two components of it. One is loan against property, which may be typically a crore or two crore. Again, there also we focus on a smaller ticket price. So in loan against property, your average yield will be lower, but that is a major component of it. And then the smaller loans that we have started on digitally and then will continue. So today, we don't any longer have any sales force for uh, 
uh, unsecured uh, business loans, you know, so that entire thing we phased out. And now we have been pilot testing our digital model and will aggressively expand this as we get confidence. So there are a couple of things more we have done. Also, we have tightened our credit threshold. So, you know, even if it's a lower yield, but we are focusing only on uh, good quality customers. Obviously, business loan for the entire industry has been very badly impacted because of COVID. But going forward, when we do digitally, our objective will be that char have a lower yield, but a lower credit losses, and no, almost negligible operating cost as far as unsecured business loan is concerned. And in secured business loan also, you may get lower yield, typically about 14%, uh, 14.5% or maybe even lower sometimes. But then uh, your collateral is there and the risk of ultimate loss is very, very limited. Okay, great, sir. So even I guess cost income, everything improves, so that's a good thing. Absolutely. Uh, second, se secondly, congratulations on the various types you have. Incrementally, what kind of, what proportion of your loans do you think will be on book and what will be through the uh, coordination types? So Thank you. Today, what is happening is that we are assigning and securitizing our books, so we are selling it down. The coordination types we started with three banks and probably we are looking at more. Uh, you know, they will take, I think, three to six months before they become significant. But till then, we'll continue to sell down our books. And even there's a huge market for that. So securitization and assignment also is a very big market. Uh, we'll continue to do that till this gathers momentum. But both these put together, uh, you know, the ratio, I think, is already 35%. So, uh, you know, over a period of next two, three years, probably this may, the incremental growth is coming from here. So if you really look at loan a book using our risk capital has declined in this quarter also. There may be, it may remain around these levels uh, and incrementally the 35% over next two to three years may become 50 to 60% also. Excellent, sir. Uh, thank you and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kosh Songira from Mahindra Manulai. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, so I have two questions. So one is uh, on your gold loan LTV. So on on a sequential basis, I've noticed that uh, a gold LT, gold loan LTV has moved up from 68 to 72 percent. Now, even if I look at uh, the standalone 72 number, I mean that looks uh, too aggressive. Uh, so wanted to understand. I mean what what exactly is our strategy? How we are uh, doing on it? No, actually 75 is allowed, and during moratorium, some of the interest would have got capitalized, which is getting collected now. And also gold prices in the last quarter, so quarter before, gold loan prices, uh, uh, gold prices had gone up, and that's why you saw that LTV was a little lower. But 72 is very comfortable. Today, banks are giving a uh, loan at 90% LTV. Uh, so, you know, you're, and in NDFC is allowed up to 75%. So, you will be competitive. But this includes also the interest due uh, is also counted as uh, uh, in LTV. When we look at the loan, we include the interest uh, accrued and due but not paid. Understood. But, uh, yeah, so I understand 75% is the regulatory uh, thing, but, but uh, uh, so one can expect the, the number to remain uh, uh, near. So in, this, in the gold business, the important thing is that how do you value and what do you tell customers? So when there's a gold, which is, say you value it as a 20 carat or 22 carat, that can make a lot of difference in uh, right. what you communicate to customers and how do you account your internally. But we are very conservative when it comes to valuing the customer's gold. So every jewelry will have certain deductions for uh, impurity or certain other things uh, uh, in that. And that is where uh, you have to build your uh, cushion. But it will remain around these levels, 68 to 72. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so se second one is on uh, our stage two number. So, uh, so on a sequential basis, if I look at absolute numbers, so stage two, uh, has moved up from around 1700 or close to 3100 or close. So I presume uh, most of it would be the COVID stressed book. But uh, internally, so, how do we. So if you see the stage two significant component is gold loan. Now, what happens in, say, home loan or business loan, money is collected automatically through banking channel on 30th day for uh, 30 days, 60 days, or whatever, you know, whenever it becomes due. In gold loan, still a significant part of collection happens in cash where. Customer either comes to the branch or you have to follow up with the customer. So typically branch people will start following up with the customer after 30 days. So you'll always see that 30 DPD is high, but most of it gets collected before 90 days. So 90 DPD will be very low. Uh, and you know, loss given default in this case is almost negligible. So gold is a peculiar business where you'll see stage two as a higher component, but that will not be, an, uh, but that doesn't get into stage three. Oh. 
Okay, no, but because I was just looking at this so, uh, earlier. Uh, so our branches time. start reminding customers of following up with customers only after 30 days. So then already moved into stage two. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah, sure. thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Savi Jain from 2.2 Capital. Please go ahead. Hello. Go ahead, sir. You're audible. Hello. Hello, can you hear yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Savi Jain, you're audible. May I request a yes. with your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. One is on the dividend. I mean, um, uh, You've announced quite a large amount of dividends. So I just wanted to understand, given that our leverage is already on the higher side, and uh, we could also do with a better credit rating, uh, you know, going forward. So, given the growth ahead, uh, I mean, is, isn't this uh, a little too high? I mean, just wanted to understand your thoughts there. No, I think our dividend is three rupees, and we have a dividend policy which is uh, board approved and declared. That anywhere from 15 to 25 percent will be our dividend payout ratio, so it's around 18 percent. And you know, if you look at our quarterly EPS, is 7.1. So out of the three rupees dividend is not so significant. And the debt to equity ratio, net debt to equity ratio has fallen uh, uh, in last quarter as our you know the we have securitized and assigned more assets. So, but dividend we have to maintain. So we have a consistent track record of dividend since listing, and uh, uh, we continue to do that. Okay. No, given that uh, you know our stock price, I mean at least uh, until the last week, it was not at a stage where you would probably be able to want to raise more money. So um, that, that, no, every that, year we have given dividend, and we've been very consistent in that. Okay, okay, appreciate. And second question is on on the wholesale uh, book, uh, you know, transfer that you talked about. So you mentioned it is at uh, is it st still at a diligence stage, or I mean, is it like at a very advanced stage, or where exactly is the is the process right now? Yeah, so there's a final diligence is happening on that, so the advanced stage, but uh, yeah, there's a diligence is underway. And you mentioned we would not need to take provisioning once we transfer uh, those assets there. So how, how, I mean, how exactly will it work? It will show as investment on our book, and we would yeah, need to write. So, uh, so the uh, if if we do if we achieve the entire target and do 3,600 crore rupees of fund, 1,200 crore will appear as investment in our books as investment in alternate investment fund. So the units will be held by us. And uh, uh, that will appear as investment in our books, yes. And and some of the and what, what part of the money will we get back? So, what happens in a sponsor's contribution? Normally, the other investors get paid off first, and then uh, the residual comes to you. Uh, the provision or not will depend on the fair value. So, uh, the, as we do, we'll understand the process. But I think those units are valued uh, on the and a fair value is taken in the book and index accounting. Which can be higher or lower than the cost, and that depends on uh, how the valuation comes out. Okay. Uh, and, and last question is on the gold loan front. I mean, uh, so there's obviously been a lot of competition by banks uh, in the last few quarters. Uh, so just wanted to understand: Are you incrementally seeing a large degree of market share loss and growth tapering off in the gold loan business? Uh, that's one. And second, uh, is this growth uh, by banks uh, a result of you know, LTV increase, which will probably reverse after 31st March, or you think uh, they, they'll continue to grow at this pace that they're growing over the last few quarters? No, I think gold, we are in, uh, increasing the customers and the gold uh, tonnage also in our custody. And uh, secondly, uh, yes, you're right, the competition has increased significantly, but there's a huge unorganized market for those pawn brokers, money lenders, and that is moving to uh, uh, the formal market, which is MBFCs and banks, uh, which is a good trend. So, you know, in last few, four or five years, we are seeing that there is an underlying trend of formalization of economy where uh, many things that were happening in the informal sector are getting back to formal sector. So, uh, while we don't have precise numbers, but I think a lot of market share is coming from there as well. Okay. And, and so, you are continuing to see the same kind of growth that you, you, you were seeing in the last few quarters in the gold business. So, you know, the, okay. When the gold prices go up, obviously the LTV goes up and all the gold loan companies will see a much robust growth. So it might taper off. It may not be as strong as the, uh, you know, in fact, in Q3 it's already a little lower than what Q2 growth was. But there will be a healthy growth. So I think 15 to 20% growth is what, you know, one should consider as a healthy growth in a year. Right. Right. And, 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 and branches you mentioned you're planning to open. So how many branches are you planning to open in the next so, this year? Probably? We can't put a number on that. 
But in both our businesses, like microfinance businesses in particular, and also gold loan business, uh, we need some more branches because there are some good locations that we left out uh, because uh, you know this entire expansion plan was paused in 2020 throughout the year, uh, all of a sudden in the early part of the year. So there are some opportunities. Uh, it will not be very aggressive expansion. Probably in 2019, we had a relative to number of branches we had, we expanded very rapidly. Uh, but uh, so it again depends. So there's a location study which is done by every area, every state, and uh, depending on that, uh, they decide on the branch network. So I can't give a number at this point in time. But as I said, that throughout this calendar year, we'll continue to grow the network. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Jain. I'll request you to come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. Yeah, please. I request to all the participants, please restrict to two questions per participant. If time permit, please come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. The next question is from the line of Amit from Robo Capital. Please go ahead. Amit, Hello. Amit Manindale, may I request you to go ahead with your question, please? Amit, may I request you to unmute your line from your side and go ahead with your question? Due to no response, we move on to the next participant. The next question is from the line of Abhiram Ayer from Deutsche CIB. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Thank you for taking some of my questions, some more of my questions. Uh, my first question was on uh, the rating uh, actions on the uh, USD loan, USD bond rather. Uh, so, which has placed a uh, USD bond on a negative rating outlook for close to 11 months now? Is there any update from the company on, you know, are there been discussions for this to be removed? Because it's quite a long time that it's, it's been on a, you know, a rating watch. So I think uh, rating agencies uh, basically had a negative on the entire sector or most of the, even the banks, very well-known banks in India. So uh, we'll engage with them again. Our liquidity has improved, even our debt equity has improved, our profitability has improved significantly. So we'll make a, you know, we'll make a representation to them. But uh, I think, uh, you know, as I was listening to in the budget speech or maybe some, that India being fifth largest economy still is not investment great. So somehow, I think rating agencies have been little, in my opinion, biased against uh, or maybe not done a fair rating for any, uh, for the Indian financial sectors. I'm not talking about IFL, but all the banks and BFCs. But as far as we are concerned, we'll engage with them because what you said is absolutely right that our numbers have improved significantly and it's a good time to go back to rating agencies. Got it, sir. The second question that I had was, was on cash flows. So, uh, forgive me if I'm being a bit technical or a bit with numbers right now. But if I look at your balance sheet and your income statement for the quarter, uh, you, you've raised debt by about, uh, uh, close to around, uh, 16, uh, 16 billion, um, INR. Uh, mm -hmm. your operating income is somewhere around 5 billion INR. So that's close to 21 billion INR, which you've received in cash and money. Whereas if I look at your, uh, the other side of your balance sheet, the cash and the equivalents have in investments have increased by only around 4 billion INR and the loans have increased around 10, 10 and a half billion INR. So there seems to be a discrepancy of around 6 billion INR so, or 600 crores if I look at it from, if I look at it. So my question was, is the, is some of the income not coming in as cash? Because no, no. that's the only thing that seems to explain this. Sorry, no, I, I mean, I am not able to, uh, Rajesh, can you understand what is her question and what are the numbers she is referring to? What I've understood uh, Abhiram saying is that yeah. you have uh, your cash uh, raised, right? But what you have to take into consideration, Abhiram, is also our AUM. Our book is growing. So we've had about 1400 crores of increase in AUM as well. Yeah. So, Out of which, no, 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 so I think, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I think the discrepancy is. Uh, the securitized assets, as per index, have to be taken in the book. Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, so that is what could be causing uh, some of the difference. So during the quarter, if you see from a uh, thousand crore of incremental securitization was done. Yeah. So what happens in a securitization, a securitized asset is that actually the risk is off the book, but index accounting, as per our auditors, you can't de-recognize. So you add the asset and loan both. But that's not in form of cash, which is why there is a discrepancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is again, but in IDF accounting, we were not required to take securitized asset. Then our loan book would have been 27,692 instead of uh, 30,000 uh, odd crores that we have. 
okay, got it. Okay. Uh, so let me connect back again, maybe offline. But what we can do is maybe uh, we can put a mail, then we can you know put the numbers in a you know reconcile them properly and put it you know yeah, so that yeah, yeah, that, that would really help. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead with the second. Um, you had another question. Yes, sir. The next question is from the line of Seva Kumar from Unify Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. So just to clarify on the uh, CRE AAF, uh, you said that uh, once uh, the AAF takes over 3,000 crores of the CRE book, you will be left with 1,300 crore of uh, residual uh, CRE uh, loans, right? Yeah, right. And, and they so, have already seen a provision of 458 crores. That's what you said. That's right. Okay. Sir, and uh, coming to your own cash infusion for the AAF, so uh, uh, from our side, it will be about 1,200 crores of uh, sponsor cash infusion. So 200 crore rupees include, uh, so the way we are planning is that we are trying to estimate that what is the last mile cash flow requirement for all these projects so that the money cap can be opened and the projects can get executed very fast. Because what we are seeing is that there is a demand for affordable housing and in fact housing has picked up all over. And then some of the projects we are seeing amazing spot of sales uh, uh, that in last few months has come. So the idea is that provide enough liquidity for last mile so the projects get completed very rapidly. Uh, so what will we do is that when we transfer certain things, so the total size is 3,600 crore, which include the cash required for last mile. So we'll estimate it properly and we'll provide for that in the fund itself. Okay. So so roughly what? So supposing the what out of 3,600, whatever cash requirement will reduce, and the remaining amount will transfer it to the fund. I see. And uh, will there be any first loss stipulation on the cash infusion being done as a sponsor? Come again? No, the no, no, okay, okay. First, the entire thirty-three percent that way is the uh, so okay. The remain the way the AIF is structured and as has happened in the industry that the senior holders they get basically fixed return and but they get a priority cash flow. So whatever cash flow is generated from the project will get paid out to uh, non-sponsor uh, uh, investors, which is the two-thirds of the fund. And the residual is what comes to sponsor. Okay, okay. So uh, as a sponsor, we'll be holding the junior trash, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. But the senior, yeah. So there, there's a fixed, uh, we'll be holding the junior trash, that's right. The sponsor is the junior trash. Okay, okay. So roughly, what will be the final cash infusion after uh, you must have done some calculations on the cash requirements of each of those projects, right? So we'll be about... Around maybe 15% of the total thing will be the cash, you know, broadly required. 15%, okay. okay. If you provide for 15% in their state, we'll make sure the project gets executed very fast. So, you know, what happens in a project, it also depends on what is the success on launch. So, when you're constructing, if the launch, you get very good response, then the cash flow from the, new, the buyers only pay for the rest of the project. But if you're conservative and you say, okay, let me plan for... Uh, even if the response is poor, but my project should not uh, get affected. So then you will provide for a little more. Okay. okay. But we don't expect it to be more than 15-17% uh, kind of a thing. Okay, 15-17% of the total size of uh, Yeah, there are more part numbers. So I really don't have the precise numbers because still this is what is the work is it's underway. And maybe next few weeks we'll have clarity on that. Any timeline, sir, when this AIF will be tied up? So, uh, as we have indicated, a binding term set has been signed and probably will consummate this transaction in this next two months. Next two months, okay. And to that extent, uh, the uh, capital will be freed up for you, right? Uh, to be That's right. So, the biggest advantage of this is that the capital frees up for us. And also, we become focused on retail, as we always said, that then our core DNA and our, uh, you know, the sweet spot for growth uh, is the retail. And uh, a digital, so then you know it becomes a very focused business model for us. So we have a four product segment which are core, as we are always always highlighted. So this non core non core segment, which already around 10 percent, uh, you know, will probably try to reduce it to as little as possible. Okay. And in the microfinance, would you continue to see the growth traction that we got to see in Q3? Yes, I think microfinance should see very strong growth. Okay, and our you know, microfinance business keeps getting local issues. But what our experience is that if you are a pan India company with all over, you know, with your presence which is fairly balanced, then the damage doesn't become very significant for the entire book. 
but we see great opportunity in microfinance uh, business going forward thank you very much i request all the participants please restrict to two question per participant the next question is from the line of jihan bara from nirmal bank please go ahead uh, sir if you can uh, sum up the, the asset quality no uh, how much is the stress book and uh, um, no what kind of credit costs uh, uh, do we foresee uh, because this quarter our uh, provisioning was uh, really low so uh, uh, no uh, and on the other hand the collection efficiencies uh, you know uh, seem to be a bit low so if you can just sum up uh, the entire uh, thing no our provisioning is not low at 267 crores provisioning is very high because historically our credit losses provisioning have been around 80 to 100 basis points which will be suffering something like 100 crore so we have provided fairly aggressively uh, in this quarter uh, and this significant amount of this provisioning is for cre and msme book uh, hopefully you know i think going forward our provisioning requirements should reduce from here right and the amount of stress book uh, uh, according to you uh, would be how much so amount of stress book is what uh, uh, we have provided for and uh, you know that is what is the uh, Uh, where we are carrying uh, our provisions our provision basically uh, if you look at uh, without considering supreme court order then 2.87 percent is our gnpa right and actually if we look at our provisions then they fairly cover that so you know you can look at that as a book which is stress book right and we don't foresee this uh, uh, 2.87 figure to increase too much no this should reduce now actually as we go forward okay 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 great thanks thanks sir. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Prashant Sridhar from SBI Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Sir, uh, thanks. Sir. Uh, just uh, two questions from my side. Uh, one is, how would we look at the growth in disbursements? Uh, would these have been more to existing or new customers? Uh, and number two, uh, just looking at the stage two and three, uh, excluding gold and real estate, uh, that is almost uh, sort of doubled. So, uh, how do we look at uh, restructuring uh, expectations over there? so disbursement trend is very uh, strong you see q3 disbursement basically uh, has been uh, already uh, you know higher than the pre covid level uh, in most of the businesses maybe gold loan q4 was 5000 which is now 4900 but other than that uh, you know disbursement is very good and obviously uh, we add new customers every month about maybe a lakh odd customers we add every month and that has been the trend even before covid and that is now continuing and probably will accelerate so as the economy recovers you see that there are new borrowers existing borrowers also need more money there are some cases of balance transfer so uh, that is about uh, disbursement trend and in terms of uh, our uh, gn uh, no i don't know what you are saying about uh, the stress book or whatever i mean i not understood your question i think if you look at our gn they have fallen from last quarter to this quarter Uh, my question was the stage 2 plus 3 has uh, uh, increased excluding gold and real estate stage 2 and stage 3 so stage 3 is what is the gnpa which is uh, uh, 440 uh, now and i don't know what, where are you referring these numbers from because these numbers are not increased they are actually fallen so i'm just adding up the stage 2 plus uh, gnpa uh, that's what so i'm what happens in stage 2 is uh, last quarter was moratorium in gold loan in particular so gold loan is something which will always till the stage two numbers so you have to look at it differently and as i as i explained in the earlier questions response that a gold loan collection effort typically starts after 30 days so this is where you will see a significant bulging of uh, you know amount in the stage two 30 to 90 days but most of these collect, get collected by 90 days and you will see the stage three is very minimal there so So, so last quarter is still coming out of moratorium so the you know this was not accurately reflecting in stage 2 but what you are seeing is a normal trend in the business now understood understood sir sure. thank you so much thank you the next question is from the line of thomas from aberdeen standards please go ahead um it's been addressed my question no further questions thank you thank you very much as there are no further As there are no further questions, I will now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Uh, thank you so, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for being on the call. And as always, uh, if you have any more questions or queries, you can always get in touch with uh, our investor relations, Anup Bhagat. 
Uh, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much.